Welcome to the Juneteenth Melanated Mondays from Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop, or BRTW, exists to disrupt any and all oppressive systems that marginalize Black people, and we use narrative and performance as a methodology to recenter Black people and experiences. With economic, social, educational, healthcare, housing, and political injustice facing our community, BRCW aims to tackle the issues that impact us while becoming a beacon for Black opportunity within the arts. Melanated Mondays is our monthly writing and performance salon highlighting a different theme at the intersection of Black justice and civic engagement. This month's theme is Juneteenth, which just became a federal holiday a couple days ago. Um, it's also known as Freedom Day, Juneteenth, the portmanteau of June 19th generally celebrates the emancipation of those who've been subject, subjected to enslavement in the United States. Specifically, it commemorates the day on which Union Army General Gordon Granger announced the emancipation on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas. And it should be noted that while Juneteenth centers on the notification of emancipation, that the Emancipation Proclamation was a pre presidential executive order that federally changed the status of enslaved people more than two years prior on September 22nd, 1862 during the American Civil War. So inherent in our understanding of Juneteenth is not just the no is not just the concept of freedom, but the concept of delayed freedom. Tonight's performances will feature pieces by Cheyenne Javon Brown, who has been featured on Melanated Mondays before. We are always thankful to have her work. Uh, a. Emanuel Leiden, who is an alumnus of the Revolution Now program. We are so happy to see that he's continuing to do well. Sergey Burbank, who has not actually worked with Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop before, and we are always happy to produce works by uh, Black artists who are new to us. We're always happy to expand our community, and for any Black writers, actors, directors, producers, dramaturgs who may be in the audience, we are in the email away. So if you have new works and if you're looking to collaborate, we are looking for reasons to pay our community of creatives. And the last piece of the evening, is Look Back at It by Emily Waters, who is also an alumnus of the Revolution Now program. Um, a special shout out for Emily in that, well, two special shout outs for Emily. Um, one is that the longer version of Look Back at It will be coming out on the Black Revolutionary Media podcast on June 24th. Uh, the Black Revolutionary Media podcast features original audio pieces by Black creatives, performed by Black creatives, directed by Black creatives, and those are out on, you know, every popular and frankly unpopular podcasting platform out there. Um, the other special shout out for Emily Waters is that she's about to be starting a PhD program across the country in Stanford, and we are so proud of her, and honestly, we're so happy for Stanford. Y'all don't deserve her. She's great. Um, we will be ending the evening with a community conversation with Crystal Lynn Webster, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Texas, San Antonio. We're going to be getting more into her work, her upcoming book, Juneteenth, and all of the wonderful things that come out of these pieces later on tonight. And before I move on to the first show, I'm just going to do some, some Zoom work. Ignore this on the live stream. And with that, I would like to invite everyone except for Jasmine and Xander to turn off their cameras as we go into Fluid by Cheyenne Javon Brown, read by Jasmine Boone as Woman One and Woman Two and Xander Jackson on stage directions. Lights up on a nervous black woman in her late 20s, early 30s. We call her Woman One. She is sitting in a room that resembles a lecture hall, empty stadium like seats all around her. Save for some lights at the front of the room where the speaker should be, the room is relatively dim. She occasionally looks around, checking her watch periodically because the stuffy room is still with silence. The seats have old school desks attached to them and open on hers is a notebook. She drums her fingers on the desk and checks her watch one more time. She's a fidgety woman who's always fussing with something. Unfuck yourself. How provocative a name is that for a self-help seminar? Well, of course, I blushed at first. And then I registered. You know, I just feel, I feel like I'm at a crossroads in my life and I'm not sure which path to take. 
two roads diversion of wood and I, uh, well, I waited for the seminar. <laughs> I kid, um, I don't know which path to take, What? but whichever one it is, I'm gonna, it's gonna make me better, healthier, stronger. So, you know, I, I'm ready to get this transformation started. Let's get the unfucking begin. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm not usually this high strung. <laughs> Oh, who am I kidding? I'm a damn clothesline. <laughs> woman one's whole demeanor suddenly changes and she morphs into woman two. Her lips are twisted, her head tilted to the side. She stares out into the audience with a face that expresses equal parts disgust and, are you fucking kidding me? Woman two is more stationary than woman one, but she's very animated with her hands while she's talking. Oh God. I see what's happening, this is about to be. All right now, I can't be sitting here with this nervous purpose. This bitch about to talk me to death. I don't even have to be here right now. I don't need no self-help seminar type shit. Anger management, the real issue, real reason I'm here. And I don't need that shit either. One only thing I need is for niggas not to test me every chance they get. Woman one returns. Her lower jaw has dropped just a tad. She looks out at the audience to see if anyone else heard what she just heard. Well, all right. Um, you certainly know what you want. I, I respect that in a woman. I'm, I've always been more of a go with the flow type of girl myself. Pardon my oversharing because I, I know you don't know me from a can of paint, but I just feel compelled to share my most intimate feelings with you so you can probably judge me for it later, but oh well, I'm doing it. I'm gonna tell you something I've never said out loud to anyone. No man has chosen me first. I'm always the consolation prize. I've had er and words test me too. <laughs> uh, I'm, but I figured if I made myself available to their needs and flexible about my growth, that they discover I'm the one and do right by me. But they never did. Mm-hmm, girl, they never will. If you let them, a nigga will treat you like an option every day of the week. And I do not play those games. I'm a lot of things, but a bad woman ain't one of them. I'm going to spoil my man and make him feel like a king because brothers got it hard, you know. I only want reciprocity. And this last nigga who shall not be named could not meet me on the bridge. All I asked was for one thing. Don't make me look stupid. Simple. But no, nigga who shall not be named wanted to test my boundaries. He was sliding in DMs. And mind you, I'm not one of those chicks who be clocking her man's moves on social media. You like a pic with a fat ass? That's fine with me. But he messaged one of the girls and she was boss enough to tell me about it. I ain't tripped right away. I thanked her and was calm for a good three days. <laughs> I used to do something sweet and sexy for him at least once a week. So on this Sunday night, I was like, oh, baby, let me run you a bath so you can start your work week off relax. He was mad hype. So I run the water, hot and steamy. I put a blood orange scented bath bomb in the water, knowing that when it exploded, it would put all these little red particles in the water. And then I got the red pepper flakes I had stashed in the medicine cabinet. And I sprinkled more than enough in the tub I'm sorry to cut in, but didn't it reek of red pepper flakes in there? <laughs> that nigga don't know nothing about what blood orange smells like. I just said it's a pungent scent. So he all, oh, thank you, baby. Thank you, baby, blah, 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 while getting in the tub. At first, he just looks soothed. So I'm like, oh, maybe, damn, maybe I ain't use enough flakes. So then I sitting on the edge of the tub and I just playfully waft the water flakes towards their target. Smiling and he's smiling and we both smiling. And then I see it. The one solitary flake that was just right fit for just the right orifice. Oh, I had never heard a man scream so loud. He tries to jump out the tub and there ain't no mask. So he's slipping and sliding and trying not to bang his head on the tile. And I just start screaming on him. That's what you get, motherfucker. You out here look, got me looking crazy like a regular, regular, snakular hoe. You out the left side of your right mind. And I'm 
going in. I don't even know if he can hear anything. I do know that his eyes were as red as the devil's dick, though. She comes down off her story high. <laughs> and then he calls the cops. Uh, but they were just mostly laughing at him. I was taken in because I had to be, but I ain't had no record. So the judge just ordered me to go to some anger management shit. And now here we are. Woman two stands grinning. Eventually, woman one starts to say something twice, but can't get the words. Well, um, that was some story. <laughs> what did you say your name was? I didn't. It's Leslie. Get out of here. My name is Leslie. What a small world. You know, Leslie, you've spoken things I haven't had the strength to even think in forever. You're a giver, but you have boundaries. I need to set so, those so that things don't eat away at me. I got a woman fired at my job. N not just any woman, like my boss was a woman in a top position at the company. I, I was so sure that she was mismanaging me. I, I wasn't growing. And I sat on that feeling for like eight months. And really, I only told anyone because it started making me physically ill, like losing weight I couldn't afford to lose. And the doctor was trying to put me on antidepressants, but I was like, no freaking way. I finally told someone about her performance. And two days after I said something, she was gone. Now that she's gone, I, I feel bad because maybe she wasn't the issue. She, she was always so kind to me. Maybe it was I that had poor work ethic. I don't know. It still feels stick to my, I still, still feel sick to my stomach. I took an other woman down. I made it harder for all of us. I see you rolling your eyes at me. I'm, I'm rambling, I guess. I'll, I'll stop. Only question I got for you, was she black? No, she was a white woman. Uh. Guilt is a useless emotion, and so is pity for mediocre white people. She had thrown you under the bus if the tables were turned, and not for nothing. It had nothing to do with your work ethic. You were getting the least of everyone on your team, but were expected to put out the most. Simmer down, ma'am. You ain't got that kind of juice to get nobody fired anyway. She was incompetent, period. Damn, I, I guess that's every black woman in corporate America story, huh? Nah. We ain't talking about your trifling ass. We talk, nah, we talk about your trifling ass right now. You still don't see it, huh? Leslie? Leslie? Our name is Leslie? You blabbering to me about not saving this white woman, but you left me to die. See, when you couldn't do it, I took care of the nigga who shall not be named, and you tossed me aside. I didn't make you look stupid. He did. I didn't make you feel incompetent. Your boss did. What the fuck are you talking about? Ha, gotcha, bitch. Stop running from me. I'm not going anywhere, no matter what we go through. I won't let, I won't let you kill me for them. And if it makes me a bitch, or if the way I deal with people is ghetto, then so be it. You are my responsibility. Everyone will just have to fucking deal. There was a long silence. There was a moment of realization and discovery for woman one, then remorse. It's finally happening. I'm having a psychotic break. Oh God, oh God, what, what is happening to me? Just breathe, Leslie, breathe, breathe. You've just been under a lot of stress and, that, and that's how it's manifesting itself. You lost your man, even though you did everything you could to keep him, but you weren't good enough. And, and, and you got this woman fired because you thought you were better than you actually were. You're an imposter. You're, you're always overreacting and you hurt other people because of it. You're overreacting now. You're hurting yourself. Stop it. Stop overreacting. I can't breathe. Oh God, Leslie, fix this. I'm dying. I, I don't want to feel this anymore. Woman one and two slowly become one. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I am here. I am enough. 
I am enough. I am enough. 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 She stands firm, taller than she has all evening. It's like a third woman has now entered the space. She has an ethereal quality to her. She regards the audience. We, I stand before you a survivor of empathetic black womanhood and a witness to the glory that comes when you start to extend your empathy to yourself first. We will no longer allow ourselves to drown in the ocean and give our dying thoughts to those in the bathtub. I started this seminar because I, like some of you, had disassociated myself to save others and was waiting for someone to save me. No one is coming, but let this experience at least be a lifeline. Unfuck yourselves. I carried you in my wounds. Did you know that? Solved you in with the balm of my grandmother's blood. I did not know what I was doing this, of course, until the salt water dissolved the layer of regenerated skin and you tumbled into the vastness, breathing and lapping me. I watched over yonder waited to see if you would return at least your essence to me. And then I sunk and I sputtered and soiled the baptismal waters with malign cries of forsakenness of, to my God, when I should have lambasted me for forsaking myself. I drowned in the ocean, but I couldn't swim. And with my dying self, so went my empathy. It tumbled to the bottom with a clear view of the base of your tub that just kept swimming, just kept swimming, just kept swimming. The me that survived had to answer for my sins. Who taught you to hate yourself? Who taught you to hate your innate prowess? So much so that you let others dictate your meaning in the world? Who taught you to put you last, anticipating that you would someday be first? Who taught you that you couldn't be both black and woman? Soft and durable, erotic and demure. To these, I had no true answer, but I will do better. I will not bind myself with the twine of your expectations your disappointments, your shortcomings, and least of all, your successes. I am fine having survived so hellish a fire. I will not die again for you. Thank you. She takes a bow and... Thank you to our actors, Jasmine Boone and Xander Jackson, and thank you to Cheyenne Javon Brown. We are always happy to have her work here. The next piece is 10 Arguments by A. Emanuel Leiden. We are especially happy to be sharing his work. A. Emanuel Leiden, whose name you might recognize, is an alum of our program Revolution Now, which pays emerging and mid-career Black writers as they create new original works, receive hand-on dramaturgical and directorial support, uh, participate in a months long workshop series and then come together to hear their work aloud, offer criticism and create something that's final and production ready. Uh, then we produce their works for audio dramas. Those are coming out now on Black Revolutionary Media. Um, a. Emanuel Leiden's piece from last year, we've already produced and it's coming out later on this year. And this is a sneak peek at his newest piece, 10 Arguments. Uh, roles will be read by Jasmine Boone as Iggy Azalea, Xander Jackson as Post Malone, Akemeni Ekpo as Kim Kardashian and Fred Durst. Tim Craig as Sean King and Donnell Cole Price as Lil Rickums, whenever y'all are ready. Booty hole. Studied in some about my booty hole. Yeah, and I'm a runaway slave. Mister, shitting on the past. Got it spinning like a past the rap to venture dim like duck bike, dash a faster motorbike. Faster, Iggy, gotta get it, bitch. Blow, full raptor. White bitch, go like a go go. Ooh, wee! Penthouse, chilling. Rooftop with the weed, when I, when I, when I, when I, Charlie Sheen. Got hoes on call. Uh, Miss Azalea. Oh, sorry, mate. I was having a bit of a video shoot. 
Hey, you work here. Uh, yeah, I, usually I'm too swamped to be in my office, but yes, ma'am. Just, just promoted last month. I apologize for the wait. I was on call with legal and it went a bit long. But welcome to Dallas. Yeah, so I read your file, but before I say anything, I want to hear from... Uh... Office phone rings. God damn it. Just, just one minute, Sister Agisha. Talk to me. Again? You know what? Now that I think about that, hold off on that until I figure out that new angle. I'm going to file a habeas corpus and ask to meet with the Ipsy Dixit. Uh... Sounds good. Trillit vibes, partner. Trillit vibes, bye. Yeah, she likes to be thorough. Gets annoying at times, but we wouldn't have gotten Geiger indicted without her. So anyway, in your report, you said some things that hit a bit close to home. It's, it's easy to lose your head with all these images of luxury everywhere. Imagery of being the best. Imagery of rising from the bottom to the top. Right, yes. Yeah, our craft, well, my craft and your former craft, it's not a lenient one. You have to stay down to earth or you'll get knocked down to earth. I don't take myself seriously and neither does anyone else. It's that simple. But see, you ought to use the proper terminology that you was really doing some and that's where you have fucked up at, understand? There's plenty of white rappers. Well, not plenty of gifted white rappers, however, not on Billboard. That's where you and I came in. I know that I suck. I, knowing it and showing it is how I've come so far. The homo sapiens Africanus doesn't smell desperation on me, so it doesn't see me as a threat. Yet they were comfortable allowing me into their den and eventually into their headquarters. Ultimately, most of them desire the soothing presence of at least one novelty cracker. Same way people get pet snakes and the genetically engineered phobia snakes decreases. Yeah, I'm a cheese it. You were a wheat thin. First of all, you should have just used your real voice in the studio. It is my real voice. I'm the one talking, right? It's a Charlie Baltimore impression. You're a pretty good one, I'll admit, but you were begging for trouble. I don't even know who that is. It's time to be honest, Sister Igford. Past time. That's all my art is about. Honesty, authenticity. Oh boy, <laughs> this is gonna be even more tedious than Ben Carson's case. A knock at the door. Belong, King. Aren't you in Atlanta? I left early. We need to discuss Geiger. I I'm in a rehab session. You're in a where? In a rehab, just come in. Sean and Rickums enter. Rickums looks like he's cosplaying Lil Bow Wow. Mrs. Azalea, one of our national board of directors, Sean King. Pleasure. Pleasure. And I'm sure you recognize- Lil Rickums! You work for the NAACP too! Church blood? Right. Right now he's an intern, but uh, I'm confident he'll be ready before we know it. We can all see how fast he's growing. No, you can't. Lil Rickums runs away, runs into something and stumbles, gradually picks himself up as they continue talking. I see qualities of myself in him. He's fearless, dedicated. Isn't it you was the one who's pissed at stealing? Poppycock, I do not steal, I amplify. How do we begin to make sense of this senseless pain? Someone should at least profit off of it. And who better or worse than me? This still doesn't make any sense. Not only can you have plenty of albums, you and you and you can run the NAACP. You're not black either. Well, um, you being, maybe you, possibly being this, discriminated against as a white woman. He runs to the garbage bin and pukes hard. Why don't you give brother Fred a call? Smashing idea, King. The call connects. Hey, Post, what's up? Brother Fred, 
I hope you're having a nice afternoon. I'm at the office speaking with Iggy Azalea. Yeah, 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 I know, yeah. Yes, and, and I think you can empathize with her if you can, you know, catch my drift. Oh, sure. I was in denial. Major, is she there? Yes, Fred, come on. Major denial. For a second there, I really thought I'd go down in history with Pac, Biggie, Maya Angelou, the goats, you know. My fall was even faster than my come up, and I had to get real real to myself. And it was hard. For years, for a while I was a bookie. What? A bookie. Damn. And now I train rookies, so they can get there. Ow. So they can get their. Ow. So they can get their badge. Ow. What's wrong, little man? You're giving Brother Fred a relapse. My head still hurts. Well, why don't you take some medicine here? Post Malone gives Lil Rickham's lean from his mini fridge. What is this? Yeah, kind of like ginger ale. It'll work, trust me. Rickham's drinks and immediately faints again. <laughs> Come on, Fred. Well, I'm a much happier person now that I rejected that inauthentic poser I made of myself trying to be something I simply wasn't and never could be. I mean, I made <laughs> a shit ton of money, but I don't even like to dwell on those years. All the paranoia, the hopeless perfectionism, it's all gone and it'll never hurt me again. I'm finally at peace. Thank you, brother Fred. Yeah, you've been a great help. Swag on fleek and throw shade on God and get down with the bomb bizzle for rizzle. Ditto. Well, I don't know what else I'm gonna do. There, there. I already uprooted my life once. We're here to help. Listen to me. You will find it and you'll be good at it. You built yourself from nothing. You are capable beyond your own recognition, okay? Okay. Everyone except Holmes Ricardito here, re repeat after me. Let's join our sister Igwell in this moment so she knows she is not alone. I hereby vow to use my whiteness as an endless well of self-promotion rather than a whip with which to lash out at others. I hereby vow to give my whiteness to the endless wheel of self-promotion rather than a whip with which to lash out at others. Sean King says nothing. Iggy in post stare. Hey, my daddy was black. Jack Black? Clint Black? Rickham suddenly wakes up. Black and Decker? He faints again. I hereby vow to use my whiteness as an endless well of self-promotion, rather than a whip which which to lash out at others. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I'm utterly famished. Where we're we going on me? Poor boys. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey. Oops. <laughs> um, I got a 50% discounted outback. They ad lib agreement as they exit, carrying or dragging Lil Rickums with them. Subtitle, social media is making you unhappy. Thank you to our actors, Jasmine Boone, Xander Jackson, Tim Craig, Akemini Ekpo, Donnell Coleprice, and to our writer, A. Emanuel Leiden. On to the next piece, Spilt Milk by Sergey Burbank. Read by Akemini Ekpo as Eve, Xander Jackson as Adam, and Tim Craig on stage directions. Interior, kitchen, morning. A charged silence while an egg timer ticks. Adam, a man, 30s to 40s, scruffy, opens a milk carton, sniffs, winces, and angrily places it in the sink. He glances over his shoulder. At the kitchen table, Eve, a woman, 20s to 30s, out of Adam's league, picks up on the glance. What? 
Adam gestures to the milk cart. That's my fault? I didn't make it go sour. I'm not a witch. Jury's out on that. Eve throws an orange at Adam's head. Ow! Take it back. Not until I've had my coffee. Then drink your coffee. There's no milk. And whose fault is that? Yours. Just drink your coffee without milk. Are you that much of a child? Take that back. <laughs> Not until you've had your coffee. It was your turn. It takes you two seconds. It takes me a doctor's visit. What? What are you talking about? Adam mutely holds up the milk cart. My God, will you pour it out? Don't leave it there. And you're going to criticize everything I do down to how I throw out my trash? I can't take a lifetime of that. Eve jumps up from the table and crosses to Adam, gets in his face. What are you saying? Nothing. If ever there was a moment, this is the moment, so tell me now. The moment for what? To change things, change the course of events. What are you saying? What are you saying? Nothing. Then nothing. A charged moment, and then Eve relents. She rests her head on his shoulder, and the contact makes him melt in turn. I'm sorry. I should have gotten more milk. I'm sorry too. You're not a witch. I'm not? <laughs> You're the good kind. Better. A warm moment of reconciliation. You're right. What was that? You're right. I'm sorry. It, it takes me two seconds. We shouldn't have to take turns. Are you sorry? Yeah. Yes. Really. Because I'm not sure that I am. No? Oh. Oh. They both look at the kitchen table on which lies the open box from a home pregnancy kit. The egg timer goes off. They jump. Adam and Eve edge towards the table as one to look. They see the screen. They react. Thank you to our actors, Akemini Epco and Xander Jackson. The final piece of the evening is Look Back at It by Emily Waters, read by Jasmine Boone. After that, we are happy to jump into our community conversation with special guest, Crystal Webster. Our story begins in 1803, when a group of Igbo people were stolen and brought to the coast of Georgia. When they got to the Gulf, they refused to stay. It said that as they walked back into the water, they sang, the water spirit brought us here and the water spirit will bring us home. Some decided to make the journey back, cloaked in the wave, folding songs of lament, recipes for survival, memories into the stream. Others decided to return by air, breathing deep, surrendering to the currents over land, leaving secret songs with the owls and maps with the crows. They sang, the air guided us here and the air will float us home. And even still, some of these folks stayed along the coast protecting, watching, and guiding their kin on land. One of these kin was my great, 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 great grandsomebody. Her name was V. Omninara, V. Omniri. Born on the dance of a rush of wind and the curling river, it said that V's first steps on land dip to meet roots of redwoods. V. Omnira carved the curve of champions, and wherever V was, the plants and animals followed. Now, V's firstborn child was my mama's 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 mama, born of the soil and earth. Her feet traced circles in the sand. Her, her name was Mama Root, an herbalist and healer. If you had a sore throat, 
Mama Root knew exactly how to crush the pine bark. If you had anxiety, she knew exactly what tincture would soothe your spirit. How did she know this? Every night she would go to the ocean and sing. I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the tree of the life. And the, water, and the water would begin to swirl as this beautiful mermaid would rise up and sing. I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the water of life. They would laugh and cry and sing and blow bubbles and trade stories and dreams and wisdom. Across town on Broad Street, there was this, a white man named Dr. Trot from New York who opened an apothecary. He had all the bells and whistles and shiny bottles. But every day his shop was so quiet you could almost hear it ringing. One day he asked someone why no one gave him any business. They said, well, we don't know you like that. And we all love and trust Mama Ruth. That night, Dr. Trot came up with a plan. As he saw Mama Ruth pack up for the night, he head down the road and followed her. She got down to the ocean and sang, I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the tree of the life. And the mermaid rose up singing, I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the water of life. And they took Mama Root down and they ate and laughed and shared their wisdom. As soon as Mama Root left, Dr. Trot ran out from behind the rock and went to the ocean singing, I got a tree, give me your tree. The water was still. He sang, I'll take your tree, I'll take your water, I'll take your tree. Then he remembered. I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the tree of the life. This time, the mermaid did rise up and he captured her and locked her up in the upstairs of the apothecary. He announced to the city, come by Friday and witness my mermaid, the wonder of the ocean. That day, the rain came down on the city heavier than it had in years. When we last left, Dr. Trot imprisoned the mermaid in order to get customers. For weeks, Charleston experienced heavy rain, flooding and roaring winds. Mama Root went to Dr. Trot and said, you need to free the mermaid. You stole her from her child in the ocean, let her go and the storms will stop. Dr. Trot laughed in her face and refused to let the mermaid return home. So that night, all the folks in the city gathered with Mama Root and knocked on Dr. Trot door demanding he free the mermaid. He refused, so they knocked the door down. Dr. Trot's eyes darted from the crowd of folks to the room upstairs and with a deep breath he said, I made it up. There was never a mermaid. Suddenly, everyone heard a loud crash. See, the roof of the apothecary had been holding the tears of the sky for weeks and weeks and weeks and collapsed under the pressure. The rain flushed all of the bottles and fish out of the building and the mermaid returned home. Just like the river always knows that it's headed to the ocean. Some may try to block it, but the water always returns home. In the end, there's a glistening of scales just below the surface. I see them laughing with dolphins. The water remembers. The water remembers even when you think you forgot. Sometimes I see my great, 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 great grandmother go into the ocean. I wonder if she stared at the line where it seems the ocean ends while it blends into the sky. It is the beginning, middle, and end simultaneously. Zora Neale Hurston wrote that men love to clip time to bits. And now we experience time like a braid or like three siblings, the ocean, river, and gurgling brook. These days we measure time by the rotations in the sky. We follow the rhythms of plants, noticing their weave and sway, the way they hold morning drops of water and call in the sun. Maybe you'll feel me in the salt speckled in the folds of the wave. Maybe you'll hear me in the rumbling bubbles of the rushing river. Maybe you'll sense me swirling at the mouth of a cave. I am the, in the vibration of the whale's song, the whispers of the fish, the steam of the hot springs. 
I am the descendant of what you imagine to be possible, sharing my voice. Seven generations forward and back and forward and back and here right now, reflecting you back to you. Whale songs, whispers and recipes, secrets misting from my surface. I place my soft forest green scarf on my braids and lay my body down to rest. If you go to the water and listen, you might just hear, I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the tree of the life. I got a right, you got a right, you got a right to the water of life. To prepare for this meditation, you may be lying down, sitting or standing. Breathe in, breathe out. How do you move when you feel free? I invite you to place your hands on your knees and get ready to throw that ass in a circle. <laughs> throw that ass in a circle. A circle calling back to your ancestors. <laughs> throw that ass in a circle. <laughs> a circle calling forward seven generations. What stories are you looking back at? What stories do you wish to bring forward? Thank you so much to Jasmine Boone and Emily Waters. With that, I'd love to invite our actors and our community conversation guest speaker to turn their cameras on as we transition to the community conversation. A reminder for all of our actors that while you are not required to stay on for the community conversation, we would love to have you and we would love to honor your intellectual labor by continuing to pay you for your time. Uh, for everyone who is watching in the audience, we do have a handful of announcements and I promise you I'm going to forget some stuff. Tim, please hold me accountable. Um, first off, I am so thankful to everyone who keeps watching these. I, I genuinely just thought it was like two or three people and then I, I checked some stuff and I kind of wish I didn't because I was like, oh shit, I, I need to script the things that I say. Um, Y'all out here apparently, hi. Um, one thing that would really, really help, uh, help us, as you know from watching Melanated Mondays, is we don't charge um, for our programs. Part of that is about accessibility. BRTW creates work that serves Black artists, and in serving Black artists, we pay our Black artists, and unfortunately that is not an industry standard. We pay our Black artists in living wage, $20 an hour. Um, and the reason why we make sure to pay everyone by the hour is because we want to make sure that their time is honored. Uh, that said, that is not free. Um, we write a lot of grants. We don't always get the grants that we apply for. We recognize that there are many ways to practice generosity. One of them is just by watching something, which ostensibly you were doing if you were hearing these words right now. Um, another way that you can help us and you know share some of your generosity with us is running us some ducats let's be real like it costs money to do this um so if you do have the capacity to donate there are a few ways to do that uh, you can venmo us at the brtw you can paypal us at the brtw um, you can go to our website the brtw.org there is a handy dandy button that tells you all the many ways that you can give uh, for those who care about making sure that their donation is tax deductible, we highly recommend that you make a donation through Fractured Atlas, which would provide you all the information that you need to write off your donation on your taxes. Uh, through both Fractured Atlas and PayPal, you can make a recurring donation. We love to encourage recurring donations because just knowing that we have 50 cents to look forward to on the 19th of every month means that on the 19th of every month, we know that we're gonna be 50 cents richer. Um, with that said, well, actually, before I make that transition, Tim, what did I forget? Oh, you 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 hit the nail on the head. You are on fire I, right now, Heather. Yay, yay! I was so prepared to be called out for being strong and wrong. Um, oh wait, no, I did forget things. Other than the website, there are other uh, ways to engage with us on social media, um, which we're so good at. And I deeply apologize for the little sound that y'all heard while I was sharing one of our writers' uh, Instagram stories to our profile page. Um, we're on Instagram and Twitter at the BRTW. We're on Facebook at Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop. And we're on all of the podcast platforms that you use and all the pl podcast platforms that no one uses at Black Revolutionary Media. Now I can transition. Um, I am so happy to invite Crystal as our guest speaker for the community conversation. 
Uh, Crystal Lynn Webster is an assistant professor of history at the University of Texas, San Antonio. She is the author of the upcoming book, Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, African-American Children in the Antebellum North. If you go to our website, the brtw.org for the upcoming four weeks, there will be a link to where you can pre-order her book. Uh, Crystal, is there anything you would like to say to introduce yourself? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, just a couple things to note. I have since moved jobs, so I'm now at University of British Columbia, and that's important for me to say because I'm coming to you from beautiful Vancouver, and with that, I want to acknowledge that I'm a guest on this land and that the land I'm on is traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So as I said, it's such an honor to be here. I know Heather from a while back, so it's lovely to see you again. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I really enjoyed the performances, so thank you. Thank you. And thank you for also bringing up land acknowledgements. I think uh, many of the people who are engaging with us are also viewing from the unceded Lenape territories, um, largely in Brooklyn. We also have you know, some viewership in Manhattan. Uh, but we do encourage everyone, if you don't know the land that you're on, please take the time and do that research. Um, there are many ways in which we all can engage with this. I know for a lot of our communities of color, it brings up a lot of difficult conversations about what it is to grapple with your accountability in this, you know, settler, colonial, aggressive, warlord, capitalist reality. But just because we were brought here without our consent does not mean that we are on our own land. So we can take the time to acknowledge that. And with that, I want to turn this over to the conversation point. Oh, and I also do want to acknowledge this is yet another OB I have brought on to this conversation. <laughs> Oberlin, the gift that keeps giving the, the handful of Black people that go there. I reach out to all of them and I figure out a way. <laughs> um, but for conversation points, obviously, we are having this Melanated Monday in honor of Juneteenth. As I said at the beginning, Juneteenth is a portmanteau of June 19th. It is generally accepted as a celebration of the emancipation of Black Americans from chattel slavery in the United States. However, it specifically commemorates the day in which uh, Union Army General Gordon Granger announced the emancipation on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas. And that's important to note because that's more than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So, in a way we're recognizing emancipation, but we're also recognizing delayed emancipation, how important communication is in making sure that people understand their freedom. So I wanna start this off with a question to everyone, including Crystal and our artists. When you think of Juneteenth, what comes to mind? And what did you expect to see reflected in a lineup of works by black artists knowing that Juneteenth was the theme? And who would like to go first? So I can go first if that's okay as a guest in this program. Um, so I love this question. And as I said, I enjoyed the performances. They were so beautiful and moving. And I think for myself and how I anticipate Juneteenth and how I have kind of come to terms with it, it's been an evolution. And I think what these performances really brought out is the kind of multifaceted ways of thinking about freedom and history and, um, I'm so sorry, my son just walked in. I was afraid that was gonna happen. <laughs> freedom and history and family actually. And I think um, one thing that I think is so powerful for all of us, um, especially- Sorry, No worries. especially as a historian, is um, to recognize the ways in which, um, as Heather just said, Juneteenth is a celebration, but it's also this, this very bittersweet moment and that it, it varies for individuals. It's very gendered, right? So I also loved how the piece is brought out, um, experiences of women, experiences of relationships, um, and that it's, um, not this singular moment, right? And this is something that I, I love to teach my students, um, that emancipation is not a piece of paper, it's not something that's given, and it's not universal, that it um, 
and it doesn't occur really at the end of the Civil War, right? We have various forms of bondage that continue beyond the Civil War. So I love, like I said, that kind of um, multifaceted and nuanced way of thinking about freedom and this question of are we really free and how do we seize our own freedom, find our own moments of joy and self-care in a, in a state and a world, in a context that often tries to rob us of that and is very anti-Black. So that's just my sort of um, what I took from the performances, but I, I'd love to hear, yeah, from the artists themselves what, what their experience was like or like with the performances. So thank you. Thank you for that, Crystal. Would anyone else like to go next? Uh, I'll go for a second. Uh, thank you so much, Crystal. Um, uh, just to kind of uh, go off of what you were talking about, the idea, this idea of emancipation. I think that's kind of been a theme of my week uh, is kind of uh, reflecting on uh, emancipation in many different ways. Um, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Ralph uh, Ellison um, uh, who wrote uh, Juneteenth, which was like a collective collection of essays. It wasn't a finished book. Um, but one of his quotes, he says, there has been a heap of Juneteenths gone by and there will be a heap more uh, gone by before we are uh, truly free. Uh, and that was definitely a quote that resonated with me uh, this week. Um, so reflecting on ideas of emancipation of self and identity and so many different forms and, and facets um, uh, has kind of helped me understand what this day is about and what this time is about. And I completely reflect your sensibility on um, emancipation not being a document. Um, and I think that that's one aspect I had to kind of mentally get over and understand um, as we move forward into the future. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd like to share at this moment. Juneteenth has always in my mind, unfortunately been centered around like black male liberation or just the concept of the entire black community acknowledging liberation, but not um, acknowledging it in a nuanced sense that is very particular to each person. Um, and especially since um, I'm a queer black woman. So being in pride month now and that being a thing is like even more uh, uh, confusing sometimes and also uh, difficult to navigate. Um, what does it actually mean to be a queer woman, a queer black woman? And what like does what does liberation look like on my body? How how can I show that I am liberated, not only from you know expectations or disappointments from other people, but what am I to be free within myself? I think fluid kind of made me question that a lot. Uh, what does it actually mean to be in sync with oneself? but also liberated of oneself. It's all, or all the baggage you bring along with that. So um, it's something I've been trying to like parcel out as, as we've been doing this whole um, conversation and listening to all the performances. It's just, um, it's an interesting conversation to have and interesting to have it with oneself and really figure out what liberation looks and feels like to you. I really love that you brought that up, Jasmine. I it brings two things to mind. First is um, something I often say about my own coming out process, which is I waited for both of my grandparents to pass and then I waited a year for it to take. Um, they are from, <laughs> it's fine to laugh at that. It's, uh, they're from the Southwest of Kentucky. And so my first experiences with Juneteenth were with a ritual that I find really sweet, but also very cis heteronormative, which is the jumping of the broom. And it was something that a lot of people really looked forward to. And um, it's, I think for a lot of us, it's going to be hard to unpack how we center narratives of liberation when they're centered in these like very cis heteronormative understandings of, you know, this is my little pocket of freedom in a context that is so deeply anti black that we're just looking for ways that we can share joy. And joy is important, like, yay, raw oxytocin, but that's not exactly the same thing as freedom. Uh, so I'm really happy that a lot of these pieces were looking into how we can unpack that a little bit. Um, before I go into the next question, I just want to make sure that we give space. Xander, if you'd like to say anything about the first one. Um, yeah, I mean, my experience personally with Juneteenth is uh, 
it's not one that is broad. So like I grew up in ensconced in white suburbia. So, um, you know, it, nowhere was it taught in school. And my first exposure was in college. Um, and even when I was in college, I went to a predominantly uh, white and Asian college. So I was exposed to it from a link that was sent to me. And I was like, oh, there's an article about this thing that you've never heard of. And like, that was my exposure uh, to, to Juneteenth and really just understanding the, the delayed emancipation of the, the people in Texas and how, you know, it, for me, it just shines a light on the fact that, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation was very legislative, but it had very little to do with exposing the freedom of the people that actually live in this country, um, you know, uh, modeled all over in these different areas of the states, but then also afterwards, just it, 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 I think that was finding out about Juneteenth and really, I, I just tend to fall into deep dives, uh, really helped me personally focus in on how um, the lack thereof of freedom for Black people in this country has just morphed. And, you know, currently today, we see that the most prevalent form is in the um, incarceration system, how that's just basically like legalized slavery and how it's just shifted in the way it's looked. And it's just been compartmentalized into different facets of how our society is structured. So it's kind of just like it, it the fact that it took two years for just everybody to even know about emancipation kind of just shines a light on the fact that it is a forever movement. It's a forever struggle that like freedom is never once just been handed out. It's been something that we've had to work towards and we unfortunately are still working towards and we still have to, you know, still have to move towards it until we are like fully free. Thanks for that. And I, I really appreciate that we've also had a chance to get into people's personal experiences with Juneteenth. I'm gonna ask the next question directly to Crystal, but I, I do hope that it's still the opportunity to get into deeper conversation. Um, Crystal, your upcoming book largely focuses on Black children in the antebellum North. Can you give us a snapshot of a Black child in antebellum New York City's experience? How did it differ from white children um, or from Black children in the antebellum South? Sure, absolutely. So I came to this project because I was doing research in um, archives near the north in New York and Pennsylvania and um, realized that the conditions and the experiences of Black children there were so marred by long forms of um, bondage and um, sort of alternative forms of slavery that extended after emancipation in the north and folks in the studies of slavery and in the studies of African-American history, we knew that emancipation in the North was gradual and that um, it occurred in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And they knew that people had to become adults before they were free. But I think because of assumptions and kind of adult-centered histories, we didn't really sit with the implications of that. So my book is the first to really look at, okay, so if you have to be an adult to be free, then what does that mean to be a child in the North? That means all, all Black children are essentially enslaved and we're not really grappling with this. We're saying, okay, emancipation happened and um, slavery ended in the North. And my book is saying, no, it didn't because black children were still enslaved. And that's really important for us to look at. And it's, um, it's not something that we can just kind of brush under the rug because they're children and say, well, they grew up to be adults. Um, and we can't do that for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that that really marginalizes, marginalizes the experience of children themselves, right? And that these children are black. So that has implications for how we think about childhood and how we um, categorize childhood by saying, well, it doesn't really matter because it's just these Black children. And then the other reason is because 
this had some really important um, important legacies and implications for systems of servitude. And one of those is that the same thing in many contexts happened in the South after emancipation. So as we're talking about Juneteenth and um, the Emancipation Proclamation and the news reaching Galveston, Texas, um, many states in the South did the same systems where they indentured or apprenticed Black children until they became adults before they could be free. So essentially they're importing the same system that the North had done decades earlier. So these are a couple important implications of the work. And, um, and the other thing is that this had some long-term legacies also for forces of systemic um, violence and racism that had their, their um, had their roots and kind of definitions in racialized ideas of childhood. So some of those that we're still grappling with today include adultification of black children, criminalization of black children and the school to prison pipeline. We see this happening even in this early period. So those are some of the, the kind of general markers of being a black child in the North at the time. But the other side of this is also what we're talking about and like carving out space for, for joy and for, um, for freedom and for resistance. And black children also did this in the North. And one of the ways that I look at this in the book is by examining black children's play as a kind of radical act of resistance. And um, I think that that's a really important element to identify that this is also happening at the same time, at the same time that we have systems of forced bondage, like enslavement and indentured servitude, we also have children finding ways to resist their laboring exploitation, to, um, to play in all these sorts of different ways, to play with the children that they're indentured with, to play when they're in schools, and um, to play on their way to school and show up late. I have these really beautiful records of a school where the teacher is saying they're always late and I'm saying well maybe they're maybe they're late on purpose maybe there's something else happening here um, so all these different ways of imagining black children's resistance through play and that's I think one important element that I really want to also bring out in this book that we do have these forces of of subjugation and um, and racism and marginalization but then on the other hand we have these forces of resistance and radical, um, radical action. On the subject of forces of resistance, that then raises the question of how did, one, how did Black children conceive of freedom? Um, and two, how did they seek and find freedom? We have this process of, you know, some form of freedom can be available when you're an adult. But I, I love this question of how are we engaging resistance? And what are some of the other mechanisms of engaging resistance? What were some of the rewards? What were some of the um, dangers of those mechanisms? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So some of the ways um, that they're conceiving of freedom, I think are, are different than adults in some ways, but also very similar. So one thing that I've seen a lot with the children that I look at, um, it's freedom, freedom to find as family and family um, reunification being a big piece of this. So in the North, um, a marker of the end of slavery was a lot of movement and migration, um, people trying to constitute families, but also people trying to find work. And a, an important element of Black children's lives was that because they were still indentured when their, their parents could have been freed. They were often separated and because they were in many institutions that were attempting to reform them, they were separated from their parents. So the work to try to get back with their parents and their siblings, I think is I th probably the most consistent and powerful ways that I see them um, working towards um, carving out their own sorts of, of, of freedom. As in the other, I think, major way is trying to adhere to um, dominant ideas of childhood. And this is the other really important 
um, phenomenon that I'm working through in the book is that this is the moment when we have um, new concepts of children where society is saying children should be um, protected, they're innocent, they should be given space to play. So the ways that we think about children today, a lot of that happens at this moment, but obviously it's not applied to black children in the same way. So I think that in their efforts to try to be seen as children to say, we deserve the same protection, we deserve the same recognition, um, we are as smart as other children, but we're also as precocious as other children. Um, in the ways that they're doing that, I think they're also trying to carve out freedom in childhood itself, right? Because if we think about that modern idea of the child, child, there's a lot of freedom in just being a child, right? Being a child is supposed to be this carefree moment of development. So in attempting to be a child, it's a, a very, again, kind of radical way of claiming a type of freedom. Thank you for that. And that brings us to the last question that's specific to this work, which is why do people need to know about this history right now? Yeah, so I think I, by mentioning some of those legacies, that's I think the most important um, way that I sort of get at what, um, what should be taken away from this, from this work and from this book. So I've been able to draw some direct parallels and um, kind of explain this through some opinion pieces on current events, which I'm always, um, as a historian, a bit reluctant to do, right? Because historians are very much, this is the moment that you're looking at and it's not happening right now, but it's so hard for me to stay in that moment when I see these direct parallels. One of the things I found fascinating were um, the tensions between um, the black community, black children and white reformers who are trying to come in and make these have these assumptions about the Black community and in the ways that they're attempting to reform children. That's, I think, a very clear kind of, um, in the language that they're using, I see the language being used today in a lot of spaces where there are um, white activists working with Black children, white teachers in Black schools. I see the exact same um, kinds of ways of describing those dynamics, which I thought was fascinating. I was looking at the 19th century, like this is the exact same thing <laughs> that I'm seeing, seeing today. Um, and then, as I said, in some of those other areas, I think criminalization has been, um, I think the most kind of tragic of the legacies that I've looked at um, for this book. And then also for my next book, Criminalization of Black Children. And I'm very excited by the work that criminal reform activists are doing these days, especially in areas of juvenile um, juvenile reform. And I think that there's some really promising um, activism going on there, but I'm really haunted by and um, reminded of the kind of significance of this work when we have cases like Makia Bryant, um, even, I mean, there are so many. It's, it's just, as I said, very, very troubling and haunting. And again, part of this um, erasure of Black children's childhood and part of this adultification, which I do see those, those long legacies in the work that I'm doing here and, and just think are so, um, so important for us to grapple with and to understand the history and, and the kind of context behind that. Thank you for that. And also thank you for um, clearing up something that I think a lot of us don't think about, not to make a teleological argument, but in terms of putting this in a, a linear sense, that there is a formation to the innocence narrative around children, the, the understanding that, you know, these are our precious baby angels, but in the formation of that narrative, people were excluded, intentionally excluded. And not only were they excluded from that narrative and whatever benefits and privileges come from that narrative, 
we're also talking about a group of people who were enslaved, a group of people who were, you know, excluded from various overlapping things. And we are now dealing with the legacy of those many, many oppressions. So thank you for, I think, pulling all of these great little pieces of history together and making it clear that, you know, these are not um, phenomena that have like manifested out of nowhere. I think that's always an important thing for people to keep in mind. Um, usually when we close, we go around and share something that we want our audience to do in response to this particular topic. I think with Juneteenth, it presents um, a unique challenge because it's been identified as a federal holiday recently. Um, and on top of that, you know, we're talking about a historical moment, but if people are so moved, I would still like to go around feel free to share with our audience as the point of Melanated Mondays is to engage with something at the intersection of black justice and civic engagement. What is our civic engagement opportunity that has arisen from this conversation that is you know, on your heart that you wanna share with the audience? I wanna start with Crystal and if we can go around. Sure, so um, as you said that last piece, it, it got me in a different direction than I was thinking. But I, I loved how so many of the pieces work through self-care and self-love. I thought that was beautiful and such a, a, a wonderful way to think about Juneteenth. Um, and I love how some of you talked about sort of seizing your own freedom through identity. I thought that was really beautiful also. And I think also speaks to um, what I was bringing um, to the conversation about Black children sort of seizing their childhood as a kind of um, emancipatory act. So I think I think that's all that I can leave you with today. I'm sure that there are other civic engagement ideas that maybe I would share later, but I love that idea for right now. Um, Crystal, you just said something that made me think of uh, speaking with your inner child. Um, I think we all could take some time to just talk and find our inner child um, and just see what they have to say and spend more time uh, nurturing them if that's what we need or just making them feel seen. Uh, I, would, I would challenge everyone to, uh, um, if not figuratively or literally, uh, write their own quote unquote uh, emancipation proclamation um, from a personal perspective. Um, uh, to revalidate and validate uh, self uh, and uh, understanding what power that has, particularly around this time, um, focusing on um, your own perspective. Thank you for that. I'm gonna I'm do the thing that I, I think is probably expected at this point, which is I'm gonna encourage people to burn some shit down. So. Um, I find it really disrespectfully ironic that Juneteenth has become a federally recognized holiday while we are trying to systematically remove critical race theory, which half of these electeds don't even know what the fuck it is. Side note, BRTW is an independently produced thing. I get to say fuck. Um, so here are my things that I would love people to do. Many of us are watching this from New York City. Call up Chuck and Kristen and remind them that part of their job is having effective conversations with their peers. Uh, I would also highly recommend that you contact your Congress people. New York City has this thing where we're in a liberal city and so we assume that everything is being taken care of. Here's the thing, I guarantee you that the liberalism, the progressivism that best serves a black interest is not the neoliberal bullshit that is being peddled in Washington DC. So we still need to be up their ass. It is indefensible that we have electeds who are actively trying to prevent people from more effectively engaging in black history, black presence, and black future, that's bullshit. It's violence and they're using pedagogy to do it. The next thing I would highly recommend folks to do is look at coalition building. We've taken a lot of time in the past few years to really take a look at the kind of subjective realities of intersectionality. And that's really important work. Um, I read a piece not too long ago called The Modern Tecumseh. And it makes a really important argument for building a kind of majoritarian new democratic bloc, 
which means we got to be able to reach out to folks and like lead stuff forward. We've had really important conversations today about the nature of freedom, the nature of communication, agency over emancipation, and violence against children, which means there are opportunities like last year when we were protesting outside of Carranza's house, he has thankfully stepped down, DOE will still be doing bullshit, which means there'll still be opportunity for us to be protesting out somebody's house. I look forward to seeing you all there. But outside of just protesting, that means Maybe sharing your Instagram with people when you're at the protest, maybe sharing your Instagram with people when you're at the DSA gatherings. Get in touch with people, figure out how you can hold each other accountable, be open to being held accountable. We all fuck up. Being called in is not the worst thing that's going to happen to any of us. It's an opportunity to learn. And I'm off my soapbox. Burn it all down. And Xander, would you like to share anything? Uh, I, I wouldn't want to belabor a point and beat a dead horse. I think everybody touched on different aspects beautifully, and I don't want to take away from anybody's voice. You know, really just what everybody said, maximize it and carry it over outside of today. Um, you know, it seems like on these quote unquote landmark events or days or months, whatever we decide to call them, is when we just was when the media and society decides to shine lights on the issues. And that's when the conversations tend to get the loudest voice, but really just keep it going, carry it on, have a conversation. And really when you're exposing yourselves to other people's experiences, really try to dig deep on your own, get that self-awareness going. And the more you learn about others, the better you learn about yourself, the better you learn about the world around you and the societies that you are adjacent to and the ones that are on the opposite side of the world of you. Thank you for that. And I just want to make sure that we have enough time for Crystal to plug her book and anything else that she wants to share. I also I, I uh, caught that you have another book coming out. We'll have to be in touch about how we can help you promote that. Anything else you'd like to share with the audience today? Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. I really enjoyed the experience. And um, yeah, I'll just look forward to viewing and, and maybe being back in the future. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's watching. And a special shout out to the actors who are no longer with us uh, on this streaming. Sorry, I heard that phrase. As I said it, it sounds dire. Um, no, they just <laughs> signed out from the Zoom. Um, Akemini Echo and Donnell Cole Price. Thank you as well to Jasmine Boone and Xander Jackson. Thank you to the amazing writers who shared their work with us this evening. Cheyenne Javon Brown, Emmanuel Whedon, Sergey Burbank, Emily Waters. Um, our other co-artistic producer, Mia Kogavia, is living her best life and not with us today. And we just hope she continues to live her best life and you will see her again in July. Um, thank you to our live stream producer, Kira Dekudre. And special shout out to our brand new line producer, Meredith King, who is going to be taking over the show in July. We are so deeply thankful and excited to have her on. Uh, and for any actors, writers, producers, directors who are looking for paid work in New York City, um, we might not be overflowing with opportunities, but we pay our people when we're hiring. Uh, feel free to reach out to us at admin at the BRTW. There are uh, descriptions on all of our program pages about how you can get involved in some of those programs. Writer's Block comes back in July for Black writers. Yes, that is a safe, creative space for Black writers. Um, Melanated Mondays is also for Black writers and Black actors. Black writers and Black actors are welcome to submit their work. If you are a white actor or a white writer, there is genuinely the rest of the industry open to you. And we highly recommend that you share this opportunity with your black peers. Um, and Revolution Now will be coming back and we look forward to supporting three to four black writers creating new work that is responding to this particular moment. Other than that, that is all I have. Tim, would you like to add anything? Thank you, Covenant Heather. Uh, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Crystal, for being here and your time. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Uh, we really appreciate you for enlightening all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it for tonight. <laughs>